question answers. Uh, we're going to do the reading from Don uh, Hill's book, Town Without Pity, I mentioned earlier, Don basically was uh, a journalist who became an editor of the Matlock Mercury about nine years ago, Don? Longer than that? Eighteen years ago. Eighteen years ago. And, uh, Suddenly, people came to this case, Stephen Downing, and as he took it on, he found more and more information being suppressed. What you've heard here is usually, certainly in the earlier ones, was about basically bank coppers. Uh, I'm not going to turn around and say all oh, policemen are bent. In this chapter, you're going to hear that somebody that's actually came forward to try and help Stephen Downing and to help Don Hill. I'll leave it to the boys. Oh, yeah. yeah. A much needed bonus came during the summer of 1997 when I received a phone call out of the blue from one of the directors of the Mercury's payment company. He told me that a new witness might be willing to come forward to add further support to Stephen's claims. A retired detective who had served nearly 30 years on the force and had been based at Bakewell. It appeared that my colleague had met a man who I would call Rodney Jones at a funeral and he thought that the graveyard location, plus the fact Rodney had met a man from the Mercury Group, had finally pricked his conscience. The former detective had told my colleague he'd been reading about the progress of the case. He'd had something on his conscience for many years about the Wendy Sewell murder and felt the time had now come to talk about it. I picked up the office phone to dial the number I'd been given and immediately put it down again. I wondered if it could be a trick. Why should an ex-detective suddenly want to offer confidential information after more than 20 years of silence to a journalist. I sat back and thought about the situation for a few moments, then picked up the receiver again. What the hell, I thought. I've nothing to lose. I dialed the number, and after a few short rings, Jones answered. When I told him who I was, he immediately started to sound nervous, even panicky. He refused to talk on the phone, but after some persuasion, agreed to meet me on the following day at my office at 11 a.m. He arrived right on time, gave the false name we'd agreed to during the call the previous day. He seemed obsessed with not being seen coming into the Mercury offices, although he had parked his large blue Volvo right outside. I ushered him straight through to my private office. Jones entered, looking like one of those 1930s American private eyes, with his coat collar turned up, and a distinctly shifty look in his eyes. They're not record this. No, nothing will be recorded. It would be helpful if we could take some notes. No notes, no. Let's just talk things through first. Jones had only recently retired from the force and was terrified of losing his pension if he talked to the press. He was also concerned about breaching the official secret side. I did my best to calm him down, gave him a cup of hot coffee, three sugars as requested, and agreed a special code to preserve his anonymity on future visits. I studied the man very carefully. He was sweating before the interview even started. I set about trying to coax out of him the reason for his visit. <coughs> All the time I attempted to conceal my excitement that I might at last be near the breakthrough. Well, I joined the force in 1962, but I left a few years later when I became disenchanted. I became a publican, but soon realised that police work was in my blood and returned to join the old Derby and came to the Bucks in November 79, I was working late in CID at Bakewell Police Station when I was asked to see someone who apparently wanted a word in private. This person, whose name was Stephen Martin, was a young man who owned a florist shop near Ripley. He said he lived with his father near the shop. He made mention of his uncle who was related to Mr. Red and lived at a farm over towards Tightwell. The uncle was said to have bred fighting cocks. The uncle had confided in Stephen Martin and told him that Mr. Red and another man had forced him to give them an alibi stating that he had been with them on that day in 1973. He wanted people to tell lies for him so there would be no connection with the murder. John paused for a breather. He was looking round all the time. He kept saying he hoped no one else from the office had seen him. I still wasn't quite sure whether he was genuine, a crank, or even a police spy determined to find out more about my progress on the case. When he mentioned the uncle-nephew relationship, it immediately brought back to me Krabby's comments at the Flash Dam two years previously. Krabby had mentioned a young man who had often visited a dying uncle in the hospice where Krabby worked. Jones said the uncle had been a farmer from Tightwell, 
a, vi a village to the north of Bakewell, about halfway to Buxton. Crabby had mentioned the uncle came from the same general direction, although he hadn't been as specific. Neither location was far from where Mr. Red lived, nor from Chelmerton, where another man who gave Mr. Red an alibi lived. It seems Jones and Crabby were talking about the same group of people. At last, I thought, some missing pieces of the jigsaw, jigsaw were finally turning up. As Jones continued, he also confirmed what I'd known for years. Wendy Sue had been Mr. Red's girlfriend. The uncle was sworn to secrecy by Mr. Red, but he was dying and he felt he had to tell his nephew, Stephen Martin. <coughs> when his uncle died just a couple of weeks later, Martin felt he had to tell the police. He thought something should be done. <coughs> That's the reason he came to the police station. He told me the whole story. Stephen Martin had always thought Mr. Red had been to a sheep sale. But he was devastated when he found out the truth. Now, I can't, I can't remember if Stephen told me the names of the other people who corroborate, corroborated the alibi at the time. They were responsible people, though. There were farmers who'd gone to buy sheep, all, all relatives of Mr. Red. Now, I think the statements were checked. Martin was in his mid-twenties at the time. I saw him again several times and even went to his house a couple of times. I applied for a copy of the prosecution file on the and it arrived in a couple of days. I took it home to read it and study it. Now, I got myself thoroughly acquainted with the fact there was a, a disputed witness statement by a man from Buxton. I was really worried now. There were major flaws in this case. I noticed about a dozen false statements from officers who did not exist. They were neither signed nor dated. There were other statements from officers who clearly had not taken the details. I, I pleaded one particular statement taken by an officer, which had his name and number on it. Now, when I checked it with him, he denied any knowledge of it. He said it was all rubbish. He said not only hadn't he signed it, but he hadn't written it. Now, he's an inspector. He was too scared to do anything about it. Then he told me to leave well and all alone and that they'd obviously made a mistake. Well, it was no mistake, though. It was all part of the cover-up. Well, then things took a surprising turn. I had a visit from a detective superintendent from Buxton, Tom Naylor. He barged right into the office and he pushed me up against the wall. He had his arm locked against my throat, but I was almost choking. He said, I hoped I didn't think I was going to get Stephen Downing out of jail. He said the shit would certainly hit the fan if I did, and he said that the press had better not get a whiff of what was happening. And I later found out that the lads at Buxton called him Creeping Jesus. He would suddenly appear behind them without them hearing his approach. And he told me that I had to interview Mr. Red with a detective sergeant, and then interview other witnesses. Well, but I said I didn't go along with that. But I was told in no uncertain manner that that was the way I had to play it. Mr. Red came down to the station at Bakewell with the solicitor at about 7 p.m. a few nights later. As instructed, I interviewed him with a detective sergeant. Well, Mr. Red was wetting himself. He, he was soaked in sweat and shaking like a leaf. He was shaking so much he, he couldn't even light a cigarette. He constantly denied ever knowing the sealed tool room. He said he wasn't even sure he'd gone to sheep sale. Couldn't remember the details. But, but he did say that there were about four people who went there by car who he named. I was unhappy about interviewing suspects and then witnesses. So I decided to refer to the fact that this request had been made by Naylor when I wrote my report. I, I put it in the last paragraph. I realised that the normal procedure would be to pull everyone in at the same time and interview them separately so that suspects and witnesses did not have time to compare notes and get their stories straight. <laughs> Within a day or so, I was given one of the biggest rollickings of my life by another officer at Buxton. He told me there'd be no need to put these comments in my report. Well, I thought my future was on the line. But I have nothing more. I saw Stephen Martin again later. He, he, he was not happy with the outcome. I remembered Crabby's comments on Mr. Red's friendly copper, and another of my informants claiming a high-ranking superintendent had supported Mr. Red's alibi. I wondered if he could have been referring to creeping Jesus, Tom Naylor. I gave a two or three page report to the divisional commander. But again, I heard nothing more. I retired in 1990, and I've been wanting to get this off my chest for a while. I, I think the thinking man is innocent. I thank Jones for his information. He wanted an assurance as to whether he, he could give this information to the authorities without losing his pension. I didn't know, and I didn't want to be accused of taking a witness. I suggested Jones should contact an independent solicitor for advice. He left the office, saying he'd be in touch again. Meanwhile, I made inquiries about Detective Superintendent Tom Naylor. One of my informants passed me a letter written by Naylor to Force Headquarters on the 1st of February 1982. 
He explained that he'd interviewed Stephen's father, Ray Downing, in September 1981 in response to a letter received by the Chief Constable from Ray. Naylor wrote, Mr. Downing gave a long history of the case and his reasons for believing that his son was innocent. A great many of the matters he raised had been dealt with in the initial inquiry. His main points were that he considered that Mr. Red, a former associate of the deceased, may have been responsible for the murder. Where possible, having in regard to the length of time which has lapsed since the murder, I have found an answer to each of the points Mr. Downing Sr. has raised. Mr. Red was eliminated from the inquiry in the initial stages of the investigation. On Saturday the 30th of January 1982, I saw Mr. Downing at the Matlock Police Station. I discussed the various matters he had raised and advised him of the outcome. So, it appeared Naylor had totally eliminated Mr. Red from the inquiry in 1982, with no mention of his being re-interviewed in 1979, nor of the claims that his alibis for the day of the murder had been drawn into question at the time. This information could have proved vital to Stephen Downing's chances of an appeal in 1980. It appeared that it had been suppressed. His defence team were never made aware that any such interviews or claims of broken alibis had occurred. True to his work, Rodney Jones returned to the office several days later. He once again entered in a cloak and dagger manner through the back door, using his agreed assumed name. As soon as he was alone with me, the words started to spill out. When Stephen Martin told the police that he knew, he couldn't believe how uninterested they were. He'd spoken to Neil and had virtually told him to go away. After this final effort, he, he just seemed to disappear. I found his sudden disappearance strange. Where had Martin gone? Jones did not know. He said he used to live in Ripley, a small town between Derby and Nottingham, and ironically, home to the Derbyshire Police HQ. He had mysteriously vanished not long after giving his statement. Nothing was ever heard from him again, so nothing happened. There was total silence from the police side. Martin's statement was filed away too. Without the ladder, it was impossible to progress. So the police just let Mr. Red off the hook? Well, that's why I came to you. I, I, I thought you would know what to do. It's a bit late. So 1980, will you at least give me a written statement? No, 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 definitely not. Well, if you won't give it to me, give it to Downing's solicitor or someone else, even the commissioner for all. And my pension? What about my pension? What's a lot of risk? I felt two emotions simultaneously. Sorry for a brave man who thought he was risking everything, and anger that he wouldn't put in writing. In the end, anger and frustration triumphed over sympathy. Then why bother coming to me if you haven't got the guts? I'll think of it. I'll be in touch. The following day, Jones phoned me and agreed to visit a solicitor in London to discuss the position with his pension and the Official Secrets Act. After that meeting, he was reassured enough to give a statement directly to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. The file containing Jones's allegations from 1979 was only produced by the police following a marathon legal struggle and the High Court demands from Stephen's defence team. Finally, the police had to give in and corroborate all this crucial information, but at a price. John Atkins said the police made him agree that all the evidence relating to Rodney Jones's interrogation of Mr. Red, which the police had at first denied existed, could not be shown to me or discussed with me. John was furious. I told him not to worry. I'd spoken with Jones on about five occasions and knew the probable contents of the file. As long as Jones's statements became part of the defence evidence, I didn't matter. 